What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode 41 of the Roots of Success podcast. I am your host, Nate the Great Peterman, coming at you. And today we have a very special guest, the man himself, John J. Quish. What's going on, brother? What's going on? Yeah, I'm glad to have you on the show, man. And of course, for those who might not know who is John, or you know, I want to know more about him. John J. Quish is a doctor in biomedical engineering and is the inventor of the most effective bone density building medical device, which has reversed osteoporosis for thousands and created more powerful as well as fracture resistant athletes. John is now partnered with Tony Robbins and OsteoStrong for rapid clinic deployment. In the process of his medical research, he also quantified the variance between power capacities from weak to strong ranges in weightlifting, which brought him to a second invention called X3. The research indicates that this product builds muscle much faster than conventional lifting and does so in less training time, all with the lowest risk of joint injury. Dr. Jay Quish is a research professor at Rushmore University, sp uh, speaks at scientific conferences all over the world, has been featured on many of the top health podcasts, is an editor of multiple medical journals, and is a nominee of the National Medical of Science. Man, John, I feel like I just read a whole biology book. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> Man, I love it, brother. But Somebody probably could have said something a little more concise to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure, man. But yeah, like I said, I'm definitely grateful to have you on the show, man. Kind of walk the audience through, I guess, you know, kind of your upbringing, where you're from, and and really, man, you know, what made you get to to where you're at today? I mean, working with a legendary sure. Tony Robbins and things, you know. <laughs> sure. Well, I tell you what, I'll uh, I'll first go through some of the science that I was involved with in, in the, my inventions and and then I'll talk about fitness and what I think your audience would be most interested in but then everybody there might be somebody out there who's not really interested in fitness please listen because at the end I'm going to talk about creating a business around ideas and kind of getting away from as as we Nate and I joked about like I just got tired of uh, going going to a job where I was applying other people's bad ideas. I wanted to apply my own bad ideas and see just how bad they are. Turns out they weren't. Uh, but yeah, like just breaking away and doing your own thing. So that'll be like at the end. So uh, is that cool with you? That's perfect, man. Yeah, do your thing. Cool. All right. Yeah. So in the beginning, uh, and I was I was uh, just out of uh, undergrad and, and getting my master's degree. At Time. I'll talk about education also. It's funny. I have a, a regular undergrad degree, a master's, and a PhD, and I'm kind of anti education. Oh, shoot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like I, I'll get to that later. Not, not really anti, but just uh, uh, the academia model. It does not do much for creativity. Mm. Uh, so, and that's kind of like, that's my, that's my thing. That's all I got. I'm creative. So uh, it just didn't really work well with me. So um, what I what I did uh, just just to get everybody up to speed, I I developed the world's most powerful bone building medical device because my mother had osteoporosis, and I and when I went to look at really what osteoporosis is, a deconditioning of bone. Well, anything that's deconditioned can become reconditioned. But that's not the way the medical world was looking at it. So I was sort of applying like a, an exercise idea to a dysfunction of the human body. And I thought like, why, why isn't there like a bone training machine? Like, cause like we grow it when we're kids because of the environment, like kids that are bedridden have osteoporosis when they're kids. So it's not an older people thing. It's a deconditioning thing. Right. Let's just figure out a way to recondition it. So I went and found the people in the world that had the highest supernatural bone density, and it was gymnasts. So, uh, so I read all the the academic research on gymnasts, and they had crazy high bone density. They also fractured a lot of bones. So, it turns out that the thing that causes the most fractures is also the thing that protects you from fractures when it doesn't cause a fracture, which is high impact. Mm -hmm. So. So what I need to do is build a device that gave the benefits of high impact 
without the risks of high impact. And so it's a computerized robotic device. It gets people in the proper position and it allows for self-compression uh, from end to end of bone. And uh, for those that watching, like, you know, th this is my humerus bone. We're compressing it end to end. So like that. And that's what triggers the growth of the micro architecture inside the bone pulls in minerals and becomes more dense, more powerful. And uh, tested it with my mother, worked with my mother, tested it with 400 other people. Uh, then I applied for patents, wrote a book, published that book. Uh, and then went and got uh, some private equity funding to get off the ground <clears throat> uh, for a prototype. And then later on partnered with uh, like, like a real business, uh, unlike in the very beginning. Uh, uh, and, then, um, and, and then brought Tony Robbins in because he was a fan the whole time. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, that's, that's how that got started. And then, of course, out of that, the, the observations I made I really, and this, this is where I kind of want to go, is um, I saw just how powerful humans were in the stronger range of motion. Now, we, we call the strong range the strong range for a reason because we know it's stronger. It's sort of like when you do a push-up, when your arms are almost fully extended, you're strong there. Like you can hold that position right? yeah. just, just short of locking your elbows out. You can hold that position you know, for a long time. But if I told you to hold a push-up position where your, your nose is one inch from the ground, you wouldn't be able to hold that for very long. Right. Right. That's the weaker range of motion. So I quantified the difference in the, the joint in question that I used was the hip joint. Uh, most, power, most power in the body goes through that joint. So what was the difference between weak range to strong range in human capability? It turns out it was sevenfold. So people were seven times more powerful in a stronger range of motion than in a weaker range of motion. So that's true. And I showed that it was, I demonstrated it was. Weightlifting is a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, I actually didn't even want to say that when I launched X3. Because there's a lot of people who are out there weightlifting. A lot of people who are very tied to it. A lot of people who have succeeded with it. Right. But that doesn't mean it's the most efficient way to do it. Like, so, you know, we used to ride horses and then someone came out with a car. So which is more efficient? Well, apparently cars, because we quit riding horses. <laughs> right. So it's like, 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 like only, only the smallest minded people believe there's no better way to do something. Yeah, that's right. true. And so, yeah, and it's a, it's, it's funny because and this is one of my problems with academia is they frequently teach you what they call is right and wrong, which is really just what we know versus maybe something we don't know yet. Mm. But you're trained to say no to what you don't know, which keeps you permanently stupid. <laughs> that's what I don't like about, and there's so much. In academia, so much even in even in medical school, like I had I had a professor say to me, "If you had and I invented I invented the medical device before I went and got my PhD. In fact, part of the reason I got a full ride for my PhD wow. was I developed it, and then I went to different universities that I want a full ride, and I, I'm coming along with my dissertation project, and it is my medical device. And you know, so I got, I got a university, Rushmore University, was like hell yeah, that sounds great. So so they, um, in, in that, like, like professors had said to me, if you had decided to get your PhD before developing this, you would have talked yourself out of inventing it because you would have been, you would have, have had hammered into your head that these certain things are the way they are. And they're like, you know, rules. Whereas, and it's a shame because so much in research can also be like disproven later. Like, so how many times you're probably not old enough, but like in my lifetime, we've been told like tomatoes are poisonous. Tomatoes are great for you. Tomatoes are poisonous. Tomatoes are great for you. The same things happen with eggs. The same things happen with meat. Uh, you know, meat was like the worst thing in the world. It causes colon cancer. And then somebody found like an absolutely fatal flaw in that research. And so that's just totally not true. In fact, there's more cardiac instances with 
people who are plant-based and people who are meat-based. So mm-hmm. like, you know, like we go back and forth, but it's always about like a greater level of learning. Yeah. So there are certain people who understand that it's just, this is what we know now, but we may know something else later. But the majority of people are like, this is what we know now. And to hell with anybody who tries to even look at anything different. So uh, that, that, that was an issue. So ultimately, like I hesitated to say things like weightlifting is a waste of time. Right. It wasn't a waste of time. But now that we have the world's most powerful variable resistance product, the X3, uh, you know, here it is right here. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's real handy. this bar can handle well over 500 pounds. Holy cow. Yeah. Right. And we have latex banding and you can see how thick this is. If you look at the thickness of my pinky and this thing doubled over yeah. like a bench press, that ends up being a 500 pound bench press only at the top. Dang. Remember I said, you're seven times stronger in the stronger range of motion than you are in the weaker range of motion. That means that what whatever whoever's listening to you, wh- whatever you think you are in strength you're actually seven times greater than you think you are in that stronger range of motion and if you can fatigue a muscle there and then diminishing ranges from back from there so like when i do a chest for like you know here's where i go where I go to full range so i do repetitions until i can't handle so I'm almost going to full extension for those just listening and not watching. Uh, so let's say I use 500 pounds 17 times and then I can't get there. Then I start doing half rep- repetitions, but I'm only getting to 300 pounds. Mm. And then the last repetition might only be an inch off my chest with 100 pounds, but the weight changes in line with human capability. Wow. It takes you to a much deeper level of fatigue. And the product is so simple, it like fits in a backpack. Like you've got your whole gym that you can, and like for like your listeners, I know there's like some, some people who you know, like live in a vehicle. Like there's, there's so many people who are just like on the road, like they're unplugged or off the grid and they totally enjoy X3 and get tremendous gains out of it. And before, you know, before that, they were, these were people who were like working on playgrounds because it wasn't anything better. <laughs> you know and like now they have like the world's absolute best strength training system uh and you know like like i when i people look at me i'm extremely muscular and i'm lean so i get stopped when i like walk into a grocery store I'm like oh, what do you do like, where do you work out uh, <laughs> uh, mma fighter are you in the nfl and i'm like okay you know number one i'm, I'm 42 so wow holy cow yeah well i I look 42 it's okay (laughs) (laughs) i was gonna say 32 john for real i mean thanks dude yeah that's nice and and then Um, you know with the arms and everything i was like man for those of you who aren't you know watching the video it looks like john has horse legs for an arm so i just want (laughs) to i i put on 45 pounds of muscle after turning 40 what yeah yeah and that would be an age where somebody would say you're not gaining any muscle after after that. <laughs> Whatever you got, you got. Dude, that's insane. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's crazy, but it is the case. Uh, so, so ultimately, uh, it's just the most convenient thing to do. And like people, so they ask me, like, you know, what do you lift? What do you do? Like, you're in great shape. And I go, I would never touch a weight. Like, it's just that's just injury safe. Like your weightlifting overloads joints and underloads muscle. We want the other way around. We want to overload muscle and underload joints. Mm. If you damage a joint, a lot of that damage is permanent. That's so like a lot, and it's cumulative. So some of these, some of these people who are like doing squats with weight on their back, uh, you know, and they, they, they go, oh, yeah, my knees aren't feeling great. Like that's cumulative damage typically. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're feeling in the joint, that's not really where you're supposed to feel the muscle on the joint. Feeling in the joint, that's not a good sign. And, uh, you know, and it's not even just a matter of having perfect biomechanics. Because every once in a while, I find some CrossFitter that's like, oh, my biomechanics are perfectly balanced. And I'm like, yeah, but you're still using extreme, like you go to fatigue in the weaker range of motion. 
or your joints are being overloaded and the muscles being underloaded. So like, I don't care how good your form is. Right, that doesn't it's matter. a bad model. <laughs> like, you know, the, you could drive your car in reverse only. Yeah. Just look through the mirror. I mean, you could, but why would you do that? It drives forward much better. That's true. Yeah, so now that there's just a better solution, just, just go for that. And ultimately, there are people like, like CrossFitters, they use this and then they go back and do their CrossFit because CrossFit's like 50-50 power and the other 50% is a skill. Mm. You have to be able to time things right, fire the muscles in the right order. It's like you can't get a strong guy and give him a baseball and tell him to throw a 100-mile-an-hour baseball. Not going to happen. He doesn't know how to do it. It's a skill. Same thing with the movements in CrossFit. Uh, those are skills. And so you need to keep reinforcing those skills. So you, you want to compete at CrossFit, then you, know, you, you do your X3 to get as powerful as possible. And then you harness that power by going through regular CrossFit workouts. So they're very compatible. Uh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah. For, yeah. So for your, uh, let me ask you this, John. So, I mean, you said you gained you know, all that muscle you know, after 40 years old. Was that just because of the X3? Was that? I, yeah, I do nothing other than that. That's insane. So, when did, so, because obviously I'm, I'm assuming you used to lift weights back in the day, right? Yeah. And then yeah, you had that. lifting weights got me to 190 pounds of 20% body fat. Wow. Um, which is, not yeah. like people looked at me and they were like, Yeah, I mean, it looks strong, I guess. Like, <laughs> nobody ever asked me if I like worked out, like, it was never something someone brought up. And now I get stopped when I just walk down the street. So, what happens? I put on 45 pounds of muscle, lost 16 pounds of body fat, so I'm 9% body fat now, and uh, I'm 220. Dang, that's insane, yeah. And uh, I keep getting just a little bit leaner, like every month. Mm. As a, another thing it does is it, it, it really rapidly upregulates growth hormone, which makes you lose body fat very quickly. Uh, and you don't need to do any cardio. Because cardio is completely counter. When, you, uh, when people do strength training and they do cardio, they kind of cancel each other out. Because strength training is trying to upregulate growth hormone and downregulate cortisol. And then when you do... Cardio, it does the opposite. So you wow. kind of end up with like a net zero effect. Huh. And that's that's really crazy. So for like, you know, legs, for example, because uh, I, I watched the one video, um, you were on the news and, and the one news anchor, she was like lifting it with her arms. So do you do, you do the same exact thing for your legs? Like, how do you do that? For the legs, um, it's front squat. So you, you put the, 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 the latex through, you know, the hooks and then the ground plate, because the ground plate protects your ankles. If you stepped on these bands and tried to do it without that plate, you might break an ankle. Oh, man. Or you would injure your ankle, one of the two. So either way, not a good idea. So you hold the bar, you know, right, it's easier when it's actually loaded. And you hold it right here and then you drop down. A front squat is much better. We pick things up in front of us. We don't pick things up behind us. Wow. Like you don't, you know, when you, if you got a, a box to carry, you don't put it on your head or behind your head, right? You carry right. it like this. In front, yeah. Like you, yeah, I hate beating up on like regular squats because there's a whole bunch of people who's like life revolves around that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, sorry. Like, yeah. yeah, how about this? You know, you know, how about training one leg at a time? There's another <laughs> foot squats. Uh, getting loading through one leg at a time so you can focus your entire body's resources on one quadricep and one glute at a time mm. well we do walk on one leg at a time we run on one leg at a time i mean unless you're a kangaroo you should probably squat with one leg at a time right okay right like they're the ones who fire both legs at once we don't do that the only time you fire both at once is when you stop Wow. Almost like training yourself to slow down. Why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. Why would you? you? No, I see that at like fitness conferences, and there's people who are like, I know they're like sharpening, like a you know, like a shiv, like I'm gonna kill this guy in the restroom later. <laughs> angry, right? Because they feel I, I, as if... I think I'm the most hated guy in fitness, by the way. No, there's no way. Mm, I 
I'm, I'm getting close. There used to be some guys uh, like um, Greg O'Gallagher used to get a lot of hate. Oh, yeah. Good old, yeah. <laughs> I love that guy. He's so cool. I see his ad every day. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. Yeah, yeah. He, he's great, great marketer. Uh, he's got killer programs. I What's so cool about about you know, let, let's try, let's actually use Greg as an example. Okay. Answer some of the conversation into like like more about like business and sort of getting off the grid. You know, rolling with your own ideas. Mm. And I think everybody who's listening is like, you know, this is I'm speaking the language. So yeah, Greg is a guy who his programming and and I went and bought it all because I, I want to really understand what he was doing. It's solid. It's good. I mean, it's regular weights. So like he did it all before X3 existed. So like I've actually pitched him on like trying to do like an X3 oh, program yeah. put them together because his audience is just, it's a little different than mine. Uh, like I, I get a lot of like bodybuilders and uh, uh, NFL people and people who follow the NFL, but I don't really think that's a millennial. I don't think millennials follow the NFL. Like my age group does, right? With my age group, we talk about what's going on in the NFL. I'm like, I don't know. I think most of my friends could name twenty five NFL players. Could yeah. do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a big NFL. Good. Okay, wow. Yeah. Okay. Personally, so I, myself, millennials are like, dude, I couldn't even tell you the names. Of this yeah, game. most millennials. Oh my gosh. Yeah, oh, they're too busy on their phones. <laughs> well, I just don't think it's all that interesting to them for one reason or another. Right. So. So ultimately, um, what I like, what I like, I like about Greg was so interesting. And this a little bit of this. So this is how I'm rolling here into into talking about uh, get, getting people to start their own business. Yeah, Greg did nothing controversial. Like his programming is pretty much the diff. There's there's different variations because he's a couple of different programs, but the programming was very much. Um, kind of standard exercise science recommendations. Uh, a lot of good tips, a lot of good things to look for to make someone's conventional workout good. Like the guy didn't, like my point is, like I'm saying something controversial. I'm saying like weightlifting, I got something way better. Yeah. That's a big deal because that's upsetting for people especially like trainers who like their whole life is revolving around teaching people how to lift weights and i'm like yeah, yeah forget i like that yeah. no i don't like that <laughs> not a good way to make friends so, um, so, but greg everything was just standard good nutritional recommendation with a he had a good backup to it and he even like one reference like some of the some of the medical studies and stuff like that he didn't need to do that like he's not he doesn't have a PhD. Like I need to do that because I'm a, I'm a research scientist. So I can't just say something. I don't give my opinion. I explain what certain research found and what that means and how you can apply it. That's, that's one thing that I'm really good at is like, here's the research and then here's how we're going to use it in our daily life. So that's, that's like my, that's what I've done with everything I've created, everything I've done, every video I do, that's kind of the model. So Everything was vanilla with Greg. And he got unbelievable online hate. Unbelievable bullying and people just telling him to kill himself. And he was stupid. His hair was stupid. and He looked like shit. And he'll never be a real bodybuilder or whatever. And uh, I, it got to him. So he made a couple of videos where he was really angry with the haters. Yeah. And, um, what, what, uh, and I think it was Entrepreneur Magazine did a great article and if you're going to start a business haters are they're just there and let me explain the mentality they are just jealous because they didn't get off their ass and do anything it's true losers straight up and i, and I don't even like calling people losers because i'd like to believe that everybody has the opportunity everybody has a thing in them a spark a trigger a something that they could come up with an idea that could impact lives and, and they would be fulfilled and they'd be fulfilling other people's uh desires and excitement and things like that i i, I really believe that every person has the ability to do that but the problem with haters is they look at something 
and they it, it it success is a mirror that they look in because everything we look at is in a way a mirror it could be you know you compare yourself yeah you look at somebody else and you go well what about what, how, how do i stack up next to this person so like for example i pull it into a parking lot from a Lamborghini. Yeah. Look at people look at me and they're like, some people are like, Brad, man, what do you do? That's the right question. The wrong thing to say is you fuck that guy. Because mm -hmm. there are I get a lot of I get a lot of middle fingers as I'm driving around. And my windows are tinted. They don't even know who's who's there. <laughs> right? Like they can't recognize John Jaguars. They're just like, yeah, I hate that guy because he has a car that they they probably feel like they can never have. And they totally could. So, so that's like, we got to get out of that mentality. Like the people who look at somebody who did something or, or, and I, a lot of this, like the haters are like fitness guys who they sit there and they're like, I've been lifting weights for years and I'm strong. And like, like, why didn't I come up with this? Mm -hmm. I hope this guy fails. In fact, I'm going to go and make 10 posts I'm going to write fake. Here's, I love this. I get fake reviews where fake people reviews. go and they're like, yeah, the product is made out of cheap plastic. Sound like plastic? It's not no damage. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they just, they just, they're just trying to do damage to the company because they're so angry. And, uh, and that's just the thing. It's just, so, so when starting a business, you, you got to know that there's going to be people, sometimes they're even be like, Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There, there are people who, who like when I started my, my first, my first business, yeah. they were like, yeah, don't do it, man. Or, yeah, you know, it's not going to work. And as soon as it worked, I figured they'd be happy for me. Oh, and they were like, yeah, well, you know, it'll fail next year. You know, like they're, <laughs> they were really, and it's, and it's the, the fact that I became a mirror that they looked in and they, for some reason, compared their self, themselves to and we're like, I feel bad because I'm not doing as well as this guy. And that's just the wrong thing to do. Like, so when I started working with Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins called me out of the blue, by the way. That's how we parted. Wow. That's he amazing. heard about my research and he's like, I'm in. Like, I want to be involved with what you're doing. So, because uh, it just made sense to him. He had a very open mind. And like, I don't look at Tony and say, well, Tony's more successful than I am. So I don't like it. Like, I'm like, Tony, teach me. Yes. Like, let me, let me learn. And uh, uh, I, I have learned amazing things. Oh, I bet. Tony Robbins. Yeah. And that guy uh, uh, <laughs> is, by the way, the energy that he throws off on stage when you're like hanging out on a long flight on his airplane or in his living room, he is yelling like that. <laughs> like it's yelling. He's yelling or he's asleep. I love it. <laughs> it's like, and I've never seen him sleep. I saw that that part is not, I'm not even sure if he does that. Uh, yeah, like he is just like hard charging all the time. Wow. It's exhausting. Oh, I bet. <laughs> That's he is. So, um, so when, so there's the, there's the whole like getting an idea and putting it together and then executing. So you did that. When you, when you start your podcast and you, you got a small business and, and uh, there's a lot of guys who are, who are doing that kind of thing. Like ultimately you figure out what you're going to do. You figure out what's, what, why is it different than what other people are doing? Um, you also try and protect what you're doing by, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. Like your brand is your personality. It's your ability to ask the right questions. It's understanding like who's, who's listening. What's like, what they're, what gets them going, what gets them excited. Um, the, the, I think a lot of people who try and communicate with the millennial population, they do it like they did to try and say, uh, oh, here's how we succeeded, you know, in the 1980s. Irrelevant, totally different world. That was like before the internet. Yeah. Like, like right now, people ask me all the time, especially older people, what, what, what conferences are you going to go to? And I'm like, mm, you know, I don't think that's a good use of my time because I can connect with like tens of thousands of people in a day. 
by doing a couple of Facebook and Instagram lives. Uh, yeah. And, and just some, some better, better posting, but interacting on, we have like a super fan forum for uh, the fans actually started. It's an X3 bar users group on Facebook. It's called the X3 bar users group. Oh, wow. And there's thousands of people in that group and they just self organized. Mm-hmm. And so I, I jump in there and answer a bunch of questions and that completely helps the business because they get to hear from me. So they know the answers researched, but also it, it like, it gives them a lot of confidence in the company. And then we have a couple reps from the company that are regular participants in that conversation. But then also they get, they get to hear from other people that are just having great results. You know, just put on another 20 pounds of muscle that they never thought they could have. Pretty That's powerful. True. It's like a family, you know, it's like a community. And that's- yeah, right, right. Everybody wants to be part of a community. You can just, you can do more online. You can always connect. So I, yeah, I would tell anybody who's, who's looking to create a successful business, uh, especially if their audience is millennials. Now, also, any millennial listening, there's a lot of business opportunity targeting not millennials. Mm. There's a lot of other people out there, but you got to know how to speak that language. You got to know how to connect with them. So, so it's all, all, it's always easiest to communicate with people who are most like you because you understand the mentality best. <clears throat> so, uh, um, my, my problem, I, I gave you kind of a preview of like the, you know, the problems with academia. So I think a lot of your listeners are probably wondering, should I go to college? It's true. Yeah. Yeah. I wore my fraternity shirt today. <laughs> that, that, by the way, best part of college right there. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I learned so many things. Yeah, that's I don't mean party. I don't. I don't mean that. I learned just just leadership and yeah. team building. And what's what's great about fraternity life is you do a lot of stuff: community service, charity work, and nobody's paid, and you can't fire anyone. Mm-hmm. You have, you have in a fraternity or sorority, you have capital that you compensate people with, and that capital is pride. Mm-hmm. That's a really important lesson. Pride. And if you can motivate people with pride, you can do anything. Wow. Yeah, and that I, that was just a an absolutely powerful lesson I learned f- from. I was president of my fraternity uh, and, and uh, oh, so proud of, of what we did and what the chapter continues to do because I, we, kept, we kept hearing from our national office. There's two types of leaders. There's time tellers and there's clock builders. So you can tell everybody what time it is, and that's, but you're needed. And as soon as you're gone, no one knows what time it is. Right. You know the clock, everybody can tell their own time. So, um, and that comes out of a book called Built to Last, which is really funny because it goes over a bunch of brands in the 90s that are going to be around forever. And like half of them are gone. <laughs> so it's wrong about all kinds of stuff. But uh, nonetheless, I understood the analogy. Right. You want to lead in an organization like that so that you put systems in place to keep the thing screwed together. Right. So it's not about a personality. It's about a system. In that system, even if it has like a leader who lacks some confidence or doesn't have the time or, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, gets drafted into the NBA or something like that and has to take off. It's like now the organization won't crash. Mm. So that was like another like massive lesson. So, so anyway, my, my problem with, with academia is like I said, you, you get at stuck in, in a kind of a, a situation where you're told that there are certain things that just are the way they are. And uh, like medical research is like a perfect example, uh, especially nutritional research. And when people ask me, like, what's, what's the right nutrition? I say, just take the word right away from this conversation. Because mm-hmm. right now we can't say right or wrong. Right. What we can say is what we know. Yeah. Because in my lifetime, there have been things like 
tomatoes and eggs and meat that have gone from being totally poisonous to like the best thing you could ever have. And there'll probably be more back and forths. Uh, you, know, you need a lot of fiber. Now it turns out fiber causes uh, diverticulitis. So strongly associated with diverticulitis. So, so yeah, like the people, especially like the raw vegans, they're eating a lot of raw vegetables and not breaking down some of that fiber by cooking. Uh, that's dangerous. Like cause you're putting a lot of work uh, on, you're putting a lot of workload on your intestines to be able to, to digest all that. And keep in mind, fiber is actually what you don't digest. So do you need it? Some would say, yeah, it cleans you out. Well, you know, if you, I guess that makes sense. Like, you know, like you rake the leaves sort of thing. But do we know that? Is that proven? What about people who are completely void of fiber because it doesn't exist where they live, like the Inuit people? They eat, they eat like whale blubber. That's like, like literally fat from whales. That's all they got. They don't have anything else. Their, their intestines are, have lower inflammation than most people. So why do we need fiber? So there's a lot of those questions. So what I, what I tell people is, instead of focusing, focusing on what's right and wrong with nutrition, focus on what we know and then what your goals are. Like figure out what, what's going to make you the leanest. Because one thing that has been proven over and over again with no conflicting evidence is that leaner people live right it's true so that that's something we could we could all go for right. uh, also stronger people live longer the stronger you are it's highly associated with length of life so lean and strong if those are your goals you're, you're gonna be fine wow yeah and that's and like that that is what we know right now right. i'm sure that could be disproven in some way but i highly doubt it because there's like thousands of papers that come to to those conclusions and reinforce those conclusions so you know i'm, I'm recommending x3 it's going to get you as strong as possible i'm recommending a certain type of nutrition uh and and the stabilization firing that comes along with x3 that uh, upregulates growth hormone that's going to get you as lean as possible and so so i i i have people focus on that uh, some of the other things, when I look at what course offerings there are in universities and, and what you can get for free, most universities you can just like go on, uh, even iTunes has so much coursework. Let's just, you can just basically attend all the lectures. They're all on video. And, um, the only thing beyond that is really proving to a potential business partner or employer or somebody who may call your abilities to question, like an employer or a business partner. Right. Are you like, you need to show them that you, you know, demonstrate that you can actually do that type of work. Now, if you take, let's say accounting courses and you run a successful business and you have Six, you have financials that are in order, you're demonstrating that you're applying what you've learned. So do you really need to be credentialed as an accountant? Or, or, or with, you know, with an accounting degree, you know, I mean, certified accountants, you could take that test and, and get, that, get that credential. So it's like, ultimately, a lot of these things that are being offered in education, you can kind of get around them or get what you need. Because ultimately, you want to, it's, it's sort of like the, the, the conversation, like, what do you want? Do you want to be strong or do you want to like do the bench press? What's your goal? Mm, that's true. Yeah. I think almost everyone would say, I want to be strong. Be strong. Okay. Yeah. Well, then you don't need the bench press. And you know, what, what, what do you want out of education? Do you want, do you want to know how to do stuff that's going to earn you money? Or do you want a piece of paper? <laughs> Man, that's deep. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Right. And, and, so, and, and I, and I said this before we, before we started recording, I'm like, 
I went and did undergrad and then I got my master's and then I got a PhD and, I, and I'm like, I'm kind of like eh, on standard education. I'm just like, so, so on it. Uh, I would never tell somebody who plans on going to university, like don't go, like you're wasting right. it. You're wasting money. That's not true. Uh, but I do have some reservations about the general way it's applied. And I told you my, my father was the second largest employer in the world at the time this is in the 1970s deputy director of the united states postal service uh this is before walmart was big so it was uh actually that, i think that was the biggest at the time it was like oh, wow. 700,000 employees maybe 800,000 but i think 800,000 was walmart yeah but that was way later so yeah what he looked at when he hired people is what did they do in their career because he, he wasn't hiring like at that point he was hiring executives and people leadership so he wasn't like, he didn't even bother to look if they went to college. It's like, what did you do in your last one or two jobs? Because those are the skills that apply most to what you'd be doing next. So ultimately like did somebody with an Ivy League education get a better spot than somebody with a lower level of education? He didn't even look. Wow. At the time, interviewed way too many people. Yeah. Just no, what, what can you do? What skills have you applied? And that's, and that, that's still true today, for sure. Like when you build your own business and it's successful, and you know, like the accounting example, keep your own books and they're fantastic, right? You know, apparently you know how to do that. Um, engineering projects. When uh, a younger guy who, who works here, who talks about how much he loves doing uh, SolidWorks, you know, computer assisted drawing, um, engineering stuff for products that actually become real and get put out in the marketplace. And there's thousands of them out there, whether, whether it be the medical device or X3. And he, he, gets, you know, he, he gets to see that and go, I, I did that. Myself. <laughs> that feels awesome. Yeah, that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Man, no, that's incredible. Let me ask you this, John. So, you know, you mentioned your father. And of course, like, I'm sure you've gained so much wisdom from him. You know, obviously, of course, employing, you know, as many people as he did, being one of the largest, you know, number two, number one. And it's like, for you, I'm sure you gained a lot. So, of course, not looking at people and, and, and saying, okay, they need to have a degree. Do they have this? Do they have that? But you kind of eliminated that. Would you say that's like the biggest thing that you really took away or what? Maybe there's something else, you know? Well, so the biggest reason that I went and got my PhD, it was like, I was like the guy that like never liked school. <laughs> so many of the projects that we were given in undergrad. It was just like, I call them make work. It's just like, here's just sure. It's not gonna teach me anything. It's just gonna take up my time. So, you know, like I just didn't care for it. And right. I thought a lot of these things were just like going through like an exercise for the sake of going through an exercise. It's just difficult to make it difficult. Mm. And, and um, you know, I don't, I didn't care for that. You know, one thing my fraternity never did was have us, you know, we were newer members, move the rocks from one side of the yard to the other and then move them back. Did you hear about that? Yeah, yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah. When we, they gave us a project, it was, first of all, a lot harder than that. And second of all, it was extraordinarily productive. Like, we would, like, like we painted a women's shelter. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah, like, that actually helped people out. We made this, we cleaned this place up, made it, you know, like dynamite looking. And the women that live there, you know, they're like battered women. You know, they, they have all kinds of like hardships in their life. And they come back to their, to their homes and they're like, huh, this looks great. Right. Yeah, right. It's like, that's the kind of work we do. But I don't want to segue too far. Uh, like ultimately, it's about... What, what you should really want out of education is just skill building. You want to be able to know how to do something. And so like when I went and got my PhD, it wasn't really 
about getting the credential so that really mattered in in medicine because i wouldn't you know i go and speak at medical conferences but what i really needed was the ability to document these discoveries and the details about these discoveries in an academic manner mm. so that i could get published in in medical journals and i could help other people so right now i'm primarily writing protocols for other hospitals and other i mean hospitals and in, in, in educational institutions i'm headed to greece tomorrow oh, sure. to work with uh some some universities in, in, a, in a big hospital because i think the biggest hospital in wow it's um, incredible right because they're going to do a research project on on my medical device and so why like I can help them author their protocol, which takes work off of the researchers and professors there because they don't want to start with a clean sheet of paper and go, okay, like, how do we apply this? So the protocol is really just like what to do and how to run it so that you get a measured outcome. That's what protocol means. When you hear okay. protocol in, a, in an academic study. So when I author that for them, it saves them a lot of work. And also, it's like I make sure that someone's actually testing the right thing. You know, somebody could test X3 for like, does it, you know, grow your hair back? And I can tell you, no. <laughs> so, right? If it, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It grows muscle really well. But <laughs> right. Clearly, it does not grow your hair back. So, um, yeah. No, I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably get you probably get called out, Mr. Clean sometimes. <laughs> I get called Mr. Clean all the time. I'm okay with it. Mr. Clean seems like a tough guy. Oh heck yeah, he's he's pretty ripped too. You feel he could be his twin. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you, having a shaved head and being in really good shape that works. Oh. Having a shaved head and being in bad shape that nah that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> just see that good old. <laughs> oh my gosh, you just see that good old skull walking around. <laughs> yeah. Dude, so let me ask you this um somebody like myself i do a lot of traveling right um and i have a lot of people that travel as well that follow me is that easy to take on like a plane uh you want to check it because okay. um there's a little bit of bit shaming going on oh. you're allowed to have like exercise devices and you say like like so dave asprey has a sticker that goes Dude, that's funny and the sticker says therapy device Oh, so the TSA sees it and they go, oh, okay, therapy device. Like, <laughs> but, you know, having a, a, a longer piece of metal, they can say this is a weapon. Yeah. But people with canes are allowed on the plane. And then they put their cane in the overhead, which could be grabbed by anybody. That's true. Right. So it's like, well, why this and not that? So, like, ultimately, um, getting this through TSA typically has to do with the fitness level of the person who works for TSA. If they're oh. fit, they're like, awesome dude, you're good to go. <laughs> if you're not in good shape, they're like, yeah, I'm not allowed. For this. Oh shoot. What about in the actual just suitcase? You could probably do that, right? Yeah, I just check it back. I just okay. Because I, I get that fit shaming thing all the time where they're just mad, like, oh of course you exercise. You know like, <laughs> they're like the trolls online. I'm just jealous. Dude, that's crazy. Now I was thinking about that because whenever we were talking about that, I was like, man, I wonder, I wonder if you could, how easy that is to get through TSA. And then you mentioned, mentioned good old Dave. I could see him doing that. I'm a, yeah. yeah, Dave Asprey. Yeah, he's, uh, I just read his book, Headstrong. I plan on, uh, actually reached out to him a couple of days ago. He's going to be on the podcast too. So that's uh, nice. <laughs> but heck yeah, Make man. Make sure to throw him some total curveball questions. Really? <laughs> yeah, because when you get him kind of off his script, he's really exciting. Oh, I can imagine. Like he gets Lord. really kind of monotone and like, okay, here and here. <laughs> and going down like his bullet list. And if you're like, <clears throat> you know, if you say something like, tell me about like, you know, somebody wants to optimize flexibility or sexual performance. So <laughs> at the same time, yeah, you know, just if you, if you get him to break his pattern, way, way more exciting guy. Because he's he's got like a ton of energy, but he presents a lot of science. And I have to walk that same line that he does because when I present at a medical congress or like where I'm going and I'm talking to these, to these groups of physicians at, at this hospital, like 
I cannot present with excitement. That's, <laughs> really, that's, that's a straight up, like you cannot do it. Right. Because you're not a promoter. You're telling them about evidence that you have seen based on, and I also have a bias. It's my invention, right? The evidence I've seen. So you can't promote it. You have to say, this is what we're seeing. And this is what these researchers found. And this is what I found initially. And I said, this is, a, this is a, uh, an opportunity to learn more by having this institution run some analyses also with a possibly slightly different population and increase our uh, chances of learning about how we can apply this intervention. Mm. Like I pretty much word for word what I'm gonna say. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, they hear and they go, yeah. We're, we're very excited to do this research. Whereas if I'm like, all right, guys, this thing is awesome. Like I can't, that's the best promotion. You can't, you can't have You're out the door. So, yeah. Dave, because he speaks to so many scientists, like he talks to me frequently. And I, like I, I don't want to rub off on him. Right. Because he's way better when he is in a mindset where he's not talking to scientists, where he's, mm. where he's really like promoting what he's discovered. I got you. No, that makes sense. So get him off his pattern. I got you. <laughs> Here's a question. Ask him about like when he discovered uh, putting the, the the butter in the in the tea. Oh yeah. Just say like, tell me that story, and he he'll, he'll switch gears. <laughs> Very happy time in his life. It was like he was like between tech startups, or he's like I think it was right after he he sold out of like a. Maybe Yahoo or something like that, but it's like he had a lot of money, but he didn't really have a lot of direction. Right. And um, it's a great problem to have. So you get to really discover, like, what do I want to spend my time doing? Mm -hmm. Question is, no, that's true. Instead of saying, like, hey, I need to find a job, it's like, what do I want to spend my time doing? Mm -hmm. Much better question to ask yourself before deciding to get into a business. Uh, or creating a business. So uh, yeah, like when he was in the Himalayas, when like when he like saw these people doing what they were doing with their tea, and he thought, I can do this with coffee. Yes. Like it, it, that's a cool story. You like it? Heck yeah! No doubt, no, I'll, I'll keep that in mind for sure. Yeah, well, I'm all about like the uh, sure. write it down. Okay, now I'll, I'll, I'll re-listen to it. And I'll uh, record no, it. Right, yeah. <laughs> But man, John, no, I uh, definitely want to be respectful of your time. It's crazy. It's already been an hour. I mean, good Lord. <laughs> um, where can uh, where can the audience find you, um, you know, on social media? And then where can they find like, you know, the X3 and everything? So social media, uh, just at D-R-J-A-Q-U-I-S-H on Instagram. Uh, Dr. John Jacobs on Facebook. Uh, and also uh, X3 Bar on Facebook. X3Bar.com is our website. But uh, probably most of your listeners are on Instagram, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do either way. For sure, man. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll attach the links below in the description for everybody to, to click on. I'll give you a follow and everything. Thank you. And uh, yeah, brother, I really appreciate your time, man. You just being on the show. You dropped immense value. Man, I don't think I'm going to do this again. I think, I think again. so many people will. And there's a, there's a couple other things I got coming out, which yeah. are for sure, brother. Yeah. Really useful for millennials specifically. Um, like I, I got a, I'm writing a nutrition book, which totally dovetails with using using X3, because everything I'm doing uh, is look. So one of the uh, medical journals I'm, I'm a, a, an editor of is the Journal of Steroids and Hormonal Science, wow. which doesn't mean cheating in sports. It means the application of uh, steroid hormones as medications or as, as, or as triggers in your own body, like your body makes testosterone, it makes growth hormone, right? Like that doesn't come from a needle. So the research in that journal is all on, on those subjects. And so what my, my area of study and what I'm, what I'm always looking towards is different growth factor triggers in the body. So how do we make the body make more testosterone? Mm. make the body make more growth hormones so like x3 does both of those things in a tremendous way I have another thing that uh is just coming out in the next couple of mm, weeks maybe a month uh 
depending on when you air this, that may or may not apply. Uh, and uh, so that, that's a, it's a growth hormone itself. Like oh, wow. it will jump up somebody's growth hormone while they use X3. It's an accessory to X3. Uh, and then some of the nutritional programming. What I will say about nutrition uh, is what I can show, what I can demonstrate by connecting a number of different studies is that um, we've got the hormones all wrong for what standard nutritional programming is. Hmm. By doing, by eating a pretty simple type of nutrition and, uh, and then applying the proper meal timing, right. you can get massive hormonal benefit. You can, you can convince your body that you need to be one, a great athlete. And your body has the ability to trigger the hormones to make you one. Hmm. Right. Like, you just want to talk to your central nervous system. You, and the only thing it reacts to is environment environment okay. how do you create an environment and that that's what that that's, that's what you want so yeah t- i hope everybody's listening who wants to know anything about what i just said please follow me on instagram heck yeah yeah i'll uh by the time this thing airs it'll probably be out as well so yeah i'll for sure attach those links too so guys yeah click those links below if you're you know obviously interested with what john has i know who and i'm about to do that after this uh this podcast brother <laughs> for real i don't think i'm hitting the gym again you feel me <laughs> nope but uh no nah, john again man i appreciate your time and uh yeah brother appreciate you thanks nate